Hello and welcome to part six of my Hogwarts Castle mock series. Today we're going to be taking a look at the viaduct entrance hall. This is the building which sits at the opposite end of the viaduct to the Great Hall, hence the name. This is a building which doesn't get a lot of time spent on it in the Harry Potter films themselves, and it isn't mentioned by name or anything in the book, so it's entirely the invention of the filmmakers. And despite the fact that it doesn't get a lot of camera time, it's a very good looking building and a very interesting design, so I thought I would show my take on it. When designing this particular building, I took inspiration from the large Hogwarts Castle set. In particular, you might be able to see that the spires at the back, the two taller ones, are directly copied from that set. It's the same reason as with the spire on the Great Hall, I think it's a really good design, and given the amount of space and the available pieces, it's the best design I could think of, so I decided that copying it on that occasion wasn't too bad. The rest of it, however, I have designed myself. As with the rest of my Hogwarts mock, this has been designed with selective compression in mind. You're probably bored of me saying that, but it is one of my big design philosophies. One example of that on this building is the number of windows on the front. There are definitely many more windows on the front of the real or the model Hogwarts castle. For instance, where you've got these pillars between the sets of windows, I believe there are actually two on either side rather than just one. But given the size of the Lego bricks and the size of the available windows and arches, which I really wanted to include, this looked far better even though it's technically less accurate. Another major feature of this building are the two front towers, here and here, with the spires on top. When designing those, I wanted to keep them to a six wide, so six stud diameter size. Unfortunately, the only piece that LEGO makes which is of that size only comes in a sort of half cylinder piece, which would mean I couldn't put the windows in, and I also wouldn't be able to do the three quarters of the cylinder, which is the half you can see on front, plus another quarter around the back, the other quarter being taken up by the actual building itself. So I decided instead to use a snot technique, that's studs not on top, using these curved slopes on the front, and then where the windows are, there are actually the one by two cheese wedges either side, which yes, aren't completely round and don't quite match, but I think give the desired effect and allow me to introduce windows. Again, not as many windows as there are on the real life model, but it meant that I was able to get the idea of having rooms and windows within those towers. Unfortunately, due to the way they're constructed, there isn't actually any space inside them. I will show you their construction, but due to the limitations of the space, I thought it was easier to just close them off and leave them as architectural details. The same is unfortunately true for the wider sections at the top here. Again, I could have used curved pieces. It would have been easier in this case because they're actually eight studs wide and Lego does make four by four curved pieces. But again, I wanted to put the windows in. So I used a different snot technique, which I will show you now, as well as the technique for the tower. So here we can see we're looking down on one of the turrets. What I'll do is I will first take off the actual cone shapes on the top and we'll have a look at how I've constructed the insides. I immediately regretted taking that off because everything went everywhere. Unfortunately, things are really only held on at the top and bottom. You'll see that it's just a complete circle there with cone shapes. There's nothing inside there, very, very simple. But then those stud into the jumpers, which are here. And then each one of these is just a identical construction, a couple of brackets, a couple of bricks, uh, a plate in there for the space. And then these are just the curved slopes, which are just held on like that. In fact, the bottom ones are only held on by one stud. They don't quite have the right amount of clutch power, which I find kind of strange, but I haven't actually had any problems with them falling off by themselves. Like I said, the entire thing can fall off if you take the uh, roof off it, but in terms of actual construction, they're okay. There are then these two by two round jumpers, which have the hole in the middle there, which then studs in, of course it would be a black brick that you can't see, to the bar in the middle there. So I'll see if I can get that back in on camera. Yeah, there we go. So that just studs in the middle. It does leave tiny little gaps on either side and the result is not a complete circle. It's a little bit bulgy, but it means I can get the windows in. And once you put the circle back on top with the cone roof on top of it, I think the effect is actually really great. Going a level further down, you can see how the corbels, which in real life would support that floor are held on, Again, they're rotated, this time not using jumper plates, uh, although these bits are actually held on using jumper plates. They're actually headlight bricks underneath, 
which are just rotated at a 45 degree angle. And again, they fill up the space nicely despite not being a complete circle. And now we're right inside the bottom bits of the tower. As you can see, there really is a limited amount of space in there. I'll just show you, this is one of the corner pieces. You can see it's bricks with studs on the side, plus the headlight brick uh, on its back, which I put in there. These are actually got two studs on the side, one there. Oh, no, they don't. There are some which have two studs on the side, like there and there, and some of them just have one. It took a long time to figure out what was actually going on in here and to be able to have everything held in. Everything is held in by at least one stud, so there's nothing just free floating here. Um, and once everything's locked together, it's great, but I'm not the biggest fan of trying to take it apart because it tends to just explode in my hands. So I've taken it apart for you guys, and then afterwards I'm going to put it back together and leave it. You can see I've used some off-coloured bricks and plates inside there where you can't actually see them. Just a good way of saving money rather than buying more tan pieces. You'll also see in the roof the solution I came up with so that the actual diameter of this piece or the bit below it can fit in there just using some of the quarter round tile pieces instead of another one of these bricks because it was just a little bit of a clash where that went round. So with that all fixed we can have a look at the inside. So the inside is only half finished at the moment. When I designed it I wasn't sure what I was going to put inside but I then decided I wanted to put the library in there. It's not quite the correct place for it, but I thought that the spaces available, this made the most sense. Because it's quite difficult to get light inside the building, what I'll do is I'll take out the individual bits of furniture so we can take a closer look at them. So first of all, we've got my version of the restricted section, which in this case is a restricted cabinet due to space constraints. Inside, you can see some books, which are plates and tiles on the side. In fact, if I spin it around, <laughs> you can see them from the back a little bit more easily. It's not such a restricted section after all. I've just put windows in front of that to act as some grills to stop people getting at them, and then some jumpers on the bottom to look like some drawers. Would have been nice to have a whole restricted section, but I thought a restricted cabinet is better than nothing. Next up, we've got a small globe. This is using some pieces which I'm not sure are made anymore, which is actually a globe of the earth, very nicely printed on two pieces which are then stuck together. It's able to rotate on the base I've created for it. I base this off the uh, one that I think is seen in one of the earlier films when they were filming in a real library, I think at Oxford University. And it was just an interesting little detail that wasn't just another stack of books. So I got one of these. They're a little bit pricey, but the printing is absolutely amazing. So I think it's well worth the extra bit of money. Next to that is just a small stack of newspapers. This is just using a very common Harry Potter printed tile and underneath just a couple of two by two jumpers so that they all stick together. And next up, we have got bookshelves, which obviously you need for a library. I've got three sets of these, one here, one here, and one here. They're identical apart from the arrangement of the books, which again are just plates and tiles. I've got this constructed on a one by four plate here for the simple reason that if I remove it, the bottom and the top don't actually connect together. They've got to be put on a studded surface because it's just tiles against the edges of plates. Also important in the library is somewhere to do your actual work. So I created this small desk, got a quill in an inkwell off to the side, another one of those newspaper prints, and then I designed a small lamp, which is actually in two places here and on a small table in the corner just there. It's very simple, just using a few pieces, but I thought it was quite accurate to the ones in the early films particularly. The table is very simply constructed as well. It's just two of these modified plates or tiles with the two studs on them. There's also a small bench slash chair next to it, which is just there. I won't take that out just because you can see what it is, just a two by four with some one by one round plates on the bottom. And lastly, because people always need rest when they're studying, is this small armchair. Again, it's a very, very simple construction, just using dark red as its main colour with some small golden feet. Just gets tucked away in the little alcove at the back there so that you can have a quick snooze and hope that Madame Pince doesn't catch you. The final thing to point out is how minifigures get from one section to the next. So in my previous video, I showed you the stone bridge, which comes at the end of the stone bridge tower. This then connects over to this turret just here. In the model, it would actually go through a doorway on this side, but I decided that rather than trying to make the inside of this more complicated, I would just have it go around. So there's a small path that comes down here, down these steps, and then through this doorway here and into the inside of the building. It's very simple. There's no Technic bricks or anything connecting this with the other parts of the castle. It all just slides together and fits absolutely perfectly. So that's it for the viaduct entrance building. 
Thank you for watching. As I mentioned in my last update, I've only got a couple more videos left of the original Hogwarts, which I showed you in my overview video. So what I think I'll do when I've shown you all those parts is to go over another overview video again to just show the few changes that I've made. And then we will start on the next sections that I've created. Thank you all very much for your support. My subscriber numbers are now well over 200, which is ridiculous and still steadily climbing. So thank you everybody who's out there supporting me and liking my content. So if you do like it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.